my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome to all you in our international physics webinar today is our 258 international physics webinar we, we have here today uh, dr freya blackman madam professor and lead scientist of dc and professor university of hamburg germany and she has already connected with us so uh, good evening madam and good afternoon to your part thanks for joining with us so before going to you i'd like to introduce shortly uh, with our student and viewers so dear student i think you have already uh, come to know the title of this today's international physics webinar title is the lsc what do particle collision teaches us and our speaker is dr freya blackman uh, professor and lead scientist of dc and university of hamburg germany so our i can see uh, she has uh, started his position as a researcher uh, at uh, atlas uh, in 2005 after completing her uh, phd from university of amsterdam and then as a research associate at cornell university in 2017 and she stayed there up to 2010 and then she joined as an assistant professor at the uh, bridge university at uh, brussels and uh, she st stayed there up to 2018 and currently she is now working as a uh, uh, professor of university of hamburg and also lead scientist at uh, uh, dc so uh, she has a many publication in renowned well known journal so i think uh, you will enjoy our uh, this session and you can also join with us by uh, using i'll uh, share our uh, joining link in the comment section and you can ask question uh, by uh, writing in the comment section also so uh, i think you will enjoy it so madam uh, you can start your session yeah i would first like to thank uh, uh, Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for the for the for the invitation. Um, it is rare that I get to uh, give a talk to people from Bangladesh, uh, so I'm uh, I'm honored to give this talk. So indeed, uh, my presentation will be about uh, uh, the L Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, and how we use that collider to uh, learn physics. So as was also already. Uh, shortly said in the introduction um uh i am uh, i did my uh, in my career i lived in many different european countries and in the us um i've worked uh, uh, and uh, i recently actually became a lead scientist at the german national particle physics laboratory daisy and i'm also a professor at the university of hamburg here you see a picture of me actually with uh the machine that i used to analyze the collisions from the large hadron collider and it's very very big as you can see and uh this is the cms uh detector so one of the two detectors that we use uh, at cern to look for uh general particles including the higgs particle which was discovered uh using this uh, uh detector uh, amongst others also by me but first i would like to talk a bit about uh uh, uh the uh, particle physics and how why we do particle physics so particle physics is all about uh fundamental particles and this is a question that has been is really as old as time where people try to uh, uh figure out what we are made out of and here you see two a very creative cavemen that are trying to see if big rocks are the most fundamental particles and they use a collider to check that there are smaller rocks inside big big rocks now this is of course a cartoon and it's a bit of a joke but in principle the idea is still very much the same what we, the way we try to study particles is by um uh, uh, colliding other particles that are very well known and then see uh, from the remnants what is inside those particles and i will talk uh, i will give some more details about that a bit later 
So to do that, we actually need to repeat these collisions many times because like one of the cavemen already said just now as well, this could be a statistical artifact. So one of the things which is very special about particle physics is that we're dealing with uh, particles that are so small that we really, everything follows quantum mechanics. So everything is random and we need to continuously uh, be aware of the fact that these things are random. And that means that we, uh, what the only thing we can really check are probabilities. So we always check uh, across a probability and calculate probabilities instead of actually uh, real numbers. And this is the nature of quantum mechanics, as I'm sure many of you already know from your courses. So after uh, comparing probabilities, you can uh, draw conclusions as far as whether something is fundamental or whether something is the smallest thing or the properties of certain fundamental particles. And uh, for that, indeed, you need to repeat the collisions and that's very important. So the important thing uh, for that is to, and what we by now know about that and have measured the building blocks uh, is sort of summarized in this particle. So of course, all of us, we know about atoms. And probably many of you also know that the atoms, they have uh, electrons around it and, uh, and a nucleus. And, and in those nucleons are protons and neutrons, uh, which are represented here by the blue and red balls. But inside protons and neutrons, for that matter, are smaller particles called quarks. And you also see how uh, large these particles, these different particles are. And you can see that compared to a, uh, an atom, which is already really small, uh, a quark is, uh, and an electron, for that matter, are really ridiculously much smaller still. And we actually don't even know how small they are. We only have an upper limit on uh, how small we definitely know they are not. So that's why you see a, sm uh, a, a smaller than sign here. So we know an electron is smaller than this number and a quark is smaller than that number. But we don't know what their actual size is. And this is one of the things that we do in particle physics. Now, this also creates a big challenge when you try to measure things that are this small. And that has to do with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where uh, you actually, to some, study something very, very small, you uh, uh, you uh, have the, you have this uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where you have this connection between the size of what you can measure and the momenta that is needed to measure it and the Planck constant. And because the Planck constant is a, a very small uh, anyway, but to measure something very small, that means you need very large uh, momentum of, uh, of uh, and for, uh, to actually study these uh, particles. And this is the reason why we use particle accelerators, because we need to study extremely high momenta uh, or uh, study the collisions of extremely high momenta particles to get to these smallest and smallest sizes. So for that, we use the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is probably one of the most famous accelerators in the world, but it's definitely not the only accelerator. There are hundreds of thousands of accelerators all over the world that are being used in hospitals, but also for, uh, for many other things and other, other different kinds of research. But what the Large Hadron Collider is, is the highest energy collider. So uh, it's definitely not the only collider, but it is the most energetic one. And that's what it's famous for. So it's a big ring that is 27 kilometers around. Uh, and, uh, and it's on the border between France and Switzerland, which is where CERN, the, uh, the European Particle Physics Laboratory is. So the interesting thing, and the other reason why uh, many physicists, including myself, uh, uh, study uh, these particles and why we want to know what uh, all these different components are made out of is because we know that just after the Big Bang, uh, in only fractions of a second, you can see it here, like somewhere between 10 to the minus 34 and 10 to the minus 10 seconds, this is when these particles existed by themselves. And so this is where particle physics is. And so understanding how these particles behave also uh, allows us to sort of interpolate back to the Big Bang and to really understand the evolution, evolution of the universe at that time. So there's an interesting link between 
something very, very small like the particles from particle physics and something very big like the universe and cosmology, a completely different uh, discipline of physics where particle physics follow, uh, uh, you need particle physics to actually explain the evolution of the universe, which is, I think, rather interesting and also quite elegant and really a wonderful thing about physics that you can use these things to do both very small things and very big things. So to do that and to describe these particles, we have something called the standard model. Now, the standard model is a, uh, it's a, a, an effective theory. So that means that we use it and we use it very, uh, uh, very successfully, but we also already know that it will not work for every scenario. So there are scenarios where we know the standard model will not work. And, and this is actually one of the big questions in particle physics is uh, to find a formula that works for everyone. Now, here you see a picture of a representa representa representation of the standard model in uh, that was actually comes from a very nice uh, movie that you can probably uh, find yourself online as well. Uh, it's called Particle Fever. And where you see uh, the different particles in the standard model, this in different quarks in red, and then the, uh, the uh, electron and their uh, and their brothers and sisters and the neutrinos in, in green, and then the particles that convey the forces, the gauge bosons in blue, and the Higgs particle in the middle to keep it all together. And those are all the particles that we know at the moment to exist and that we can describe with the standard model. Now, of course, this, uh, this film, Particle Fever, is a film that is intended for general audiences. So uh, it's much more fair when we are dealing with physicists to actually also talk about mathematics. So here you see the tensor representation of the standard model. And if you really compress it uh, uh, very much, you can make, it, make that <coughs> representation small enough that it can fit on this very nice mug that you can buy at CERN in the gift shop as well. That in principle has all the behavior of all the known particles in this formula. Now, of course, this is uh, a very compressed notation, so I think it's a bit unfair. So if you would actually uh, write this out, then this would be the formula of the standard model. And I think that's a lot more fair to, uh, to look at in some sense as well, to also really represent the complexity of, uh, of the different interactions that this uh, the standard model describes, which is where each of these terms is an interaction between different particles and different forces. Now, the standard model is fantastically good at uh, predicting uh, the things that it can actually predict. So, uh, uh, and, and this is also one of its powers and also why it's considered one of the successes of modern physics. And here you see uh, a recent uh, uh, result from, uh, from, my, from my experiment, from the CMS experiment, where we have measured the frequency uh, of how often uh, particles, different particles and different combinations of particles are made at the Large Hadron Collider in a way to, uh, 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 to measure that is a property called the production cross-section, which, uh, which is on the y-axis here. And then on the x-axis are the different uh, particles and how often they are made. Uh, so what you see here in this plot is you see both the predictions, which are in gray, uh, and then you see the measurements for different uh, energies of the running of the Large Hadron Collider. And you see very, very uh, many different measurements. And each of these is probably, is the result of, of probably 10 people and a few uh, uh, people who are doing their master thesis or their PhD thesis to actually measure this. So there's a lot of work in this one plot. And, but what you can also see is that most of the predictions, uh, particularly the very frequent ones, they agree very well. But and uh, the the disagreements between say the uh, the prediction and uh, and the measured point tend to come uh, always in the very very rare processes and this is also where we by now specialize at the LHC is to understand um, uh, the uh, the very rare production of particles um, and for which we need a lot of collisions. 
So as I said, the standard model is very good at describing everything, uh, but it is an effective theory, and it's an effective theory that can be uh, parameterized with only few, relatively few free parameters. And one of the ways you can parameterize these free parameters are the parameters that are on the y-axis in these two plots. And both of these two plots are co internal consistency plots uh, tests where you uh, put in all the measured information that we know of the standard model, and then uh, uh, try to predict one of the three parameters of the standard model and then compare it. And what you see, particularly in the right plot, is that uh, uh, the standard model, in, if you look at it that way, is not necessarily so internally consistent. So you get the prediction of the standard model, which in the right plot is the blue bars. And then you try to uh, check that against the data, which is the black points. And you see that very often they do not agree. Now you can also sort of do this half halfway thing where you put all the, the other, all the other points in except one and then compare the prediction. That is the orange bars. And you can see there it gets sort of better, but still there are some points which really do not agree at all with the standard model. And we think this is because, uh, as I said, the standard model is an effective theory and we're still missing some information to make this a complete theory. So there are also some more um, experimental, I would say, motivations uh, uh, for the standard model to be uh, incorrect. So uh, one can say, yeah, it's an effective theory. It doesn't work uh, in certain uh, uh, scenarios. You can say, yeah, there's infinities. Um, that's all very true. But you can also just say, OK, there are really actual physical phenomena this comp that we just cannot calculate at all. It's not that, they that you cannot calculate them in certain scenarios, but it's that you really cannot calculate them at all. And uh, these are uh, the following things. So for one thing, the in the standard model, matter and antimatter behave almost the same. So that means that uh, at the Big Bang, there should have been the same amount of matter as antimatter. This is actually the problem if you think about it, because of course, all of us, both here in, in uh, Hamburg, but also uh, you, are made out of matter, not, not out of antimatter. So this antimatter, we do not know where it is. And the standard model cannot explain this imbalance between matter and antimatter. It also cannot explain the presence of dark matter. As you probably are aware, there are multiple astrophysics and astronomy observations that, uh, uh, that show that there is a, a, is a quite a lot of matter in the universe all around us that is obviously not made out of the atoms that we know. So this is called dark matter. And uh, uh, dark matter, there is no particles in the standard model that we can use for dark matter. And that's also true for dark energy. Um, and I think last, but also very importantly, uh, in the standard model, the neutrinos that we have uh, are massless. And there's actually, uh, people have measured that neutrinos actually have mass. Uh, this was a Nobel Prize. And, uh, and effectively, the only way to explain that neutrinos have mass in the standard model is to add additional undiscovered particles to the standard model. So, so this in, in total already gives you, I think, some very compelling arguments to uh, say that the standard model is not complete, even beyond the mathematical arguments. One might also say that the standard model does not explain many things. Eh? For example, why do certain particles have much bigger mass than other particles? Or why is the structure of the standard model a certain way? No, none of these things are actually really uh, described by the standard model. So this is quite, these are quite big open questions. And even answering a fraction of these questions can already get you a Nobel Prize. These are very interesting questions, but also very difficult questions to answer, obviously. So one of the ways we sort of look at, uh, at these problems nowadays is, uh, is by using a, a set of arguments called the little hierarchy problem, or sometimes also called naturalness, where we talk about the fact that we think that if you take this whole big standard model equation, and uh, there's quite a lot of different ter terms, some of them negative and some of them positive, and there's a positive and negative in quantum interference as well, and one needs needs a lot of this quantum interference to actually balance out. And this is what I try to represent here with this uh, artwork that has it has a balance in there. And what we in that case would need to happen is the fact that the, the mass of the Higgs particle 
is balanced against the mass of quite a lot of different particles that we know in the standard model, but just with the standard model particles, we cannot make a balance. So we need extra particles. And these are the particles that we typically call beyond the standard model particles or BSN particles. So this is why there's a BSN question mark here. Now, if you would do that in the context of Feynman diagrams, you would say that you would have uh, sort of all these different loop uh, diagrams that you can calculate, which uh, add uh, probabilities that you can, uh, that each particle are, is produced and, what, and that predict the mass of each particle. But to add an additional particle uh, to that, uh, and you sort of require that this balance is, uh, is working within 10%, that would give you masses of extra new BSM particles that would have to be um, smaller <coughs> than say two tera electron volt for a fermion and five tera electron volt for a boson. And this is, this is a really nice number for us because these numbers are actually accessible by the Large Hadron Collider because the Large Hadron Collider has energies um, <coughs> at the moment at 13 tera electron volts. So of course, something that is about half we could actually measure. And this, by the way, is also why the Large Hadron Collider was built that way. So <coughs> one of the big solutions that, uh, uh, that you also, for example, need to do string theory and many other, and quantum gravity for that matter as well, is supersymmetry. And supersymmetry predicts that uh, there is a whole uh, sort of um, gauge uh, mechanism that uh, predicts the same number of uh, fermions as bosons and that we only have seen half of these particles. And what is important to be aware of is that at the Large Hadron Collider, we typically can only look at a very small fraction of supersymmetry models. And this is what I made in the little uh, green dot here. And the rest of these models is much more difficult for us to study or we just haven't started studying yet. So when you hear people say that the Large Hadron Collider has excluded supersymmetry, you need to be very aware of what that means. So that does not mean that everything in this red circle is already excluded by the Large Hadron Collider. It means that we have already checked everything in this green circle and we didn't see it. But of course, there's still quite a lot of other stuff to check. So one of the things that I uh, work on quite a lot, and this is what I'm going to be talking about uh, a bit more now and in a bit more detail, is the top quark. So there are six different quarks and they have many, many different masses. And uh, it's not very much explained why the masses are different. I already saw them. And what is even more spectacular is that there's, there's this one quark, which is so much more heavy than any of the other quarks. And it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's heavier than any other particles by far. And uh, there is no explanation of why this mass is so high. And as you might also remember from some of your lectures, uh, mass is also a property that is connected to the Higgs particle, which at the moment is not uh, so well understood yet. So it could also be true that the top quark has a special role in the interaction with the Higgs boson because of its large mass. So the top quark was already uh, discovered in 1995, and I actually was lucky enough to do my doctorate on the first large data set of top quarks. So I've been doing top quark physics for a long time. As I said, it's a, the heaviest known uh, fundamental particle, and because it's so heavy and it live and it lives so so shortly, it actually as, is the only quark that does not couple to other uh, particles through the strong interaction before it decays. And this means there's no hadronization. That means top quarks are really uh, very special beasts that can, can can also be used to study the properties of what a quark is really like without having to deal with the fact that quarks only exist in bound states typically. So as I said, the top quarks was, were discovered in 1995. Here on the left, you see um, uh, you see what the, uh, uh, the two distributions, and you will see many of these kind of distributions in my talk, because this is the sort of probabilities of how we work in particle physics. So we have some distributions here where you see uh, the number of collisions that we see, and that's on the y-axis, and then as a function of some property, in this case, the 
in this case the mass of the uh, of the of the total uh, uh, energy that was deposited in the in the detector, and then you see some background prediction, which uh, and then you see uh, sometimes something extra, and that is sort of in this case the, something extra is top quartz. So you see that both the uh, the zero experiments and the CDF experiments saw seventeen and nineteen extra collisions uh, or events, as we call them. Uh, on top of what we expected just from uh, from uh, normal already understood collisions. And those collisions were then attributed to the top quark, and that was the discovery. So today we make tens of, th so thousands of top quarks per minute. We make a lot of uh, top quarks. And that means that the LHC really is a top quark factory. And we can use top quarks both to measure them very, very precisely. And I will talk a bit later about why that is interesting. And we can also use top quarks themselves to see if there's particles that interact or decay with top quarks. And that's mostly what I do in my, uh, in my work. Because the Large Hadron Collider really is a search machine. So the idea is because it is so high energy, uh, it really is intended to look at the smallest scale, so at the smallest particles or at the highest energy, but also it collides very frequently. So it, um, it, uh, it also allows you to look for very rare particles. So in principle, we uh, have uh, uh, 40 megahertz bunch crossing. So what that means is that there's 40 million times per second there's a collision at the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, and even with those numbers of collisions, we, for example, only make 600 collision, uh, 600 top quarks per minute, and we make 30 Higgs bosons per minute. And of course, for new physics particles, we don't know how often they are. We make them per minute, and it also depends on the sort of the type of particle and on the theory that is supporting that particle to predict the probability. But compare that already to the 40 million per per second, and you can already understand what the challenge is here. There's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of collisions. And uh, most of the collisions are not so interesting. And we and the, the job is to find sort of this needle in the hair, haystack, this rare gem of a collision that is different uh, from the not so interesting one. And of course, because it's quantum physics and you're dealing with statistics, you need not one of those, but you need a statistically significant number of those. And, uh, and that's what we really do at the Large Hadron Collider. So for that, we have very intricate cameras that are situated around the collision points. And these are very, very big. So you already saw the picture at the start of my presentation uh, of, uh, uh, of the CMS experiment. So that's the experiment on the, on the left. And it's, oh, that's already 15 by 22 meters. So it's already big, but the Atlas detector is even bigger. And both of these are consisting of many different layers situated around the collision point where each layer has a different task to measure different particles. So with those different uh, uh, part, with those different sub detectors around the, the collision point, we can in principle measure many, well, most of the particles in the standard model we can measure uh, quite reliably, except for neutrinos, of course, because neutrinos are, uh, well, they don't interact not very much with matter. So neutrino with matter. So neutrinos, we sort of uh, infer by the fact that we see that there's missing information, and that must have meant that there was a particle there that we didn't see. So this you see here, uh, particularly in the little table, where you see with all the different layers we have in such a detector. So this is a little slice out of uh, a detector like that where each particle has a slightly different signature, where some leave information in the first layer, some inf leave information in the second layer, some in the third layer, some in all layers, and some in non-layers, and that's the neutrinos. So I also already talked about the fact that we collide 40 million times per second, but that is actually an underestimation because by now, our accelerator is so intense that each of those times when we collide 40 million times per second, there's not one collision, but there can be 30 or 40 or 50 collisions even. And here's one of our record-breaking collisions where there were actually 78 collisions happening at the same time, and that every 40 million times per second. So you can see that these, uh, and we call this pileup when there's many different collisions piling up together. And you can see already from all the green lines, each of those is a charged particle. Uh, we're trying to find 
uh, a particle that you're interested in in these collisions is really a, very much a challenge. So for that, we use um, uh, an experimental method called particle flow, which tries to use the information from all the different parts of these different layers of the detector to distill this into a simple a picture as possible and to essentially identify, depending on the signature that you see, whether something was a charged hadron, a neutral hadron, a photon, a muon, or an electron. And if you then do that, you can start uh, really start counting different collisions. And this is what we do here. So uh, for top uh, production at the LHC, we know how these are made. So top, uh, so 95% of the uh, top quark pairs that are made at the Large Hadron Collider come from the collision of gluons, actually not of a quark, an antiquark from the protons. And uh, well, we can talk about why that is logical, but in principle, it has to do with uh, uh, with uh, quantum chromodynamics and the fact that uh, the strong force is a running force. And uh, when you get to these kind of energies, you really are sensitive to the gluons of the strong force, not of the quarks themselves. Uh, the top quark mass is, as I said, it's a special uh, has a special role in the standard model because of the connection to the Higgs boson, and this also means that you can actually measure the uh, the top quark mass yourself. And if you correlate that with the W boson mass, and this is what you see here, you get the two green lines, and uh, that's the uh, the line where you measure measure both the W boson mass and the top quark mass very accurately. And then you can compare that to the predictions of the standard model. And here you can also, uh, so those are the sort of ellipses here. And the interesting thing is one of the, these, well, these ellipses, one of them is not so accurate. Uh, and that's the standard model prediction. Uh, and so improving this standard model prediction uh, will really uh, uh, also help us to test the standard model uh, accurately. But if you then start comparing it and you include things like the Higgs boson, in the standard model prediction, you get the blue ellipse. And what you probably notice is that the blue ellipse is not agreeing so well with the uh, this sort of black, po black point that's coming from the two green lines. And this, again, gives us a hint that there is an in internal consistency problem in the standard model with the Higgs boson, the W boson, and the top quark. And this is a reason to measure the top quark as accurately as possible to see if we can understand where this uh, disagreement comes from. So to do that, we measure practically everything there is to do about top quark. So we measure both how often it's made and we can use quantum chromodynamics to, uh, to test those predictions and then compare them to data. We can also test how often top, top quarks decay. So top quarks are unstable particles. So they, uh, they, uh, they will only live a very short amount of time and will then decay to other particles in the standard model, specifically to a W boson and a B quark. And then the W boson will decay further. And that probability is actually also given in the standard model and we can test that. Uh, the spins of these W bosons are directly connected to the spin of the top quark. So we, of course, we think the top quark is a fermion with spin one half, uh, but this is but this we uh, we can actually check directly. And this is the only uh, uh, fermion that is really an elementary particle where you can check this directly, which is really cool. And that's because the top quark lives so shortly, so it doesn't hadronize. Uh, so, of course, there could be other particles that create top quark pairs. So we uh, pairs. So we also look for those. And of course, we try to measure the top quark mass uh, because it's because of this connection to the Higgs boson. And we try to see if there are other particles, not just top quarks, that decay in the same way. And so all of that, uh, so all of that is a really active uh, program that we do uh, uh, both at Daisy, but uh, in many other places that I'm involved with. Now, when you think about how you really go going to see top quarks in your collisions, you have to think about the fact that this top quark will always decay to a B quark. Uh, so that's here in the in sort of the little circle and a W boson. And that W boson, we know how that, uh, uh, how that will decay because that's again an unstable particle. And uh, that is a particle that was already uh, discovered in the 70s and 80s in the last century. And, uh, and we know very precisely how that particle decays. And that means we have different scenario whether the W bosons decay to leptons or to quarks. And depending on, and because you have top quarks tend to be produced in, 
in pairs of two, so a top quark and a top antiquark, that means you have different permutations where you have more quarks or more leptons. And these uh, different categories are indicated here, where you have in the blue the scenario where essentially you only have quarks in the collision. And then in the red and orange scenarios, you have the scenarios where you have only very few uh, quarks and mostly uh, 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 leptons. Now, all of those, when you want to isolate these kind of collisions uh, from your huge number of background collisions, uh, the question then becomes uh, uh, how easy it is to, uh, to find and to isolate these collisions and how much other background there is that looks very similar. So for these dilepton events, where both Ws decay to leptons, this is relatively easy. But at the same time, these Ws also decay to two neutrinos, which we cannot measure. So there are difficulties to then reconstruct and measure uh, the properties of the top, top quark. At the other side, you, of course, you have the very difficult scenario where the uh, two W bosons decay to quarks. And in that case, uh, the problem is there's many other things that look very, very similar. So you will have to, uh, you ha will have millions of events that look identical for each top quark. And uh, so that uh, makes it very, very difficult to find these and to isolate these. But once you have them, it will be very easy to actually study them because all the information is still there and detect the thing in the detector. So typically we actually work in this intermediate final state where you have uh, only one of the uh, W bosons the case to a lepton. And so it's called the lepton plus jets final state. And then you only have one neutrino. So it's sort of manageable there. So to do that, you can measure, and here, the, here you can see the many different measurements that have been uh, done uh, over time to measure this, this to measure the top production cross section here as a function of the collision energy very, very accurately. And here you see just the different measurements from CMS up to 2018. So there's, and you can also see that there's really, that these all agree very well with the theory prediction, which is these curves. Now the question then becomes, is there more to see? And uh, 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 there we talk about the fact that, uh, uh, so if you just see top quarks, uh, do you know anything more? Do you need to look a bit more detail in how these top quarks are behaving? And uh, so we now have so many top quarks that this really uh, is, is an option. So we start looking for, um, uh, uh, collisions which, for example, have many other objects together with top quarks or that have uh, very, very massive top quark production or have top quarks uh, produced together with invisible objects. And all of these are in principle unexplored and, and really teach us a lot about the properties. And, uh, and many of those would also create, uh, would create excesses if they come from uh, collisions uh, from uh, uh, where different new particles are produced. So some of these are here. So uh, like, for example, com composite top quarks or uh, extra uh, SUSY particles called S-gluons or vector-like quarks, which are uh, fourth generation quarks or dark matter particles or extra Higgs bosons or extra Z bosons or extra W bosons will all create uh, essentially, they would not change anything of the main top quark behavior, which was in this blue ellipse in the center. But if you go to the more extreme scenarios, they would start to change the way the top quarks uh, behave kinematically. So they might be, they might become more energetic or there might be resonances and things like that. So this is what we now do at the Large Hadron Collider with top quarks. So to do these kind of measurements, you need to start isolating not just top quarks, but top quarks in a very specific uh, signature. And um, uh, here, for example, you see some um, uh, 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 some work from uh, uh, Douglas Burns, who uh, got his uh, doctorate in my group, where, uh, where we started to measure uh, top quarks produced together with additional gluons. And here you see again, you see the data and you see how often uh, uh, these collisions are made in the LHC data set. This is about one year worth of data taking. So you see that the standard top quarks without anything special after all selections in one year of data taking, we have say somewhere like 200,000 of those. But then uh, you also have a lot of scenarios where you have top quarks with extra stuff up to uh, uh, up to say uh, 
six or ten even extra quarks and gluons that are being produced. And you can also see that quantum chromodynamics can really predict these things uh, already to quite a uh, high level. But if you really go to the very high multiplicities, it, it does not agree. So this is, of course, very important to understand in detail because these extra particles would be living in those scenarios. They don't necessarily uh, uh, live in the scenario where you just make top quarks. You make top quarks with plus extra stuff. And uh, this is where uh, why we want to uh, understand whether what we see here extra has to do with real new particles or just with the fact that we have not enough statistics or that we need to understand quantum chromodynamics better. So to do that, we use a, 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 a technique called unfolding. Uh, now, what we're trying to do here, and unfortunately, the plot is not uh, uh, really so clear, because the idea is that you more or less you have the standard model and you add some, the, in, but when you measure it, the standard model, you add some noise to it. And here you maybe see this a bit better. So you have your physics, which is smeared, but you can, from simulation, you can actually understand how uh, the particles that are detected by these experiments are actually smeared. And you can then convert that into what really happened before you detected it. And this is what you then see here on the right. And there you can, uh, uh, can really understand and directly map this to standard model calculations that you saw, for example, on this mug that I saw before. And you can also see that if you compare them to different ways where you can calculate them, that not, not all of them agree with the data, which is quite interesting. So uh, one of the other things that I do is to really look for very, very busy final states. And there you really have to start looking for rare production. So uh, I am very interested in looking at the production of four top quarks at the same time, which is not really measured very accurately yet. And these are really very, very busy collisions. So here you see an actual collision recorded by uh, the compact ring on solenoid by CMS, where you see there's all these orange cones and all these tracks. Those are the are, are jets from gluons and quarks. And then there's a muon in there. And, it's, and there's lots of stuff, lots of stuff happening all at the same time. Uh, and four top production also is still uh, or uh, still orders of magnitude smaller than than top quark pairs and also smaller in production than top quarks plus a Higgs boson. And because in that case, if you have four top quarks, you have four W bosons, these can also decay uh, again to both leptons and jets. So you can do exactly the same thing. And here you see the little pie chart to what that would mean. So there's a lot of signatures there with only one lepton or with two leptons. So this is where I mostly work. So if you compare that between uh, four tops and uh, and top quark pair production, you see that the uh, the amount of collisions with one or two leptons is very different. And you can also see that, or probably imagine that the two lepton and the one lepton final state actually have top quark pair production as a background. So the analysis strategy in that case uh, for say this green pie chart and this yellow pie chart is to understand top quark production very, very accurately and then see if there's anything extra. And this is what you see here again, uh, when you start looking in the, uh, in the scenario where you have um, uh, say more than uh, 10 jets, this would be where four top production li uh, lives. So we are actually quite confident that a lot of the the reasons why the data does not agree so much as very high uh, jet multiplicity is because of uh, the production of uh, uh, four top quarks, which would produce at least six extra jets. So that's here in this triangle. So now this is a very, very difficult uh, place to look for. And because you need to look for, you need to look through many, many, many collisions, and then you look for something very rare. So for that, we actually use artificial intelligence. Uh, so we, uh, and this is an example of a typical, difficult uh, 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 Large Hadron Collider search for a new particle or a new physics process, where you do a basic selection. And after that, you try to train a neural network to actually uh, select the colli collisions that are interesting for you, because you just cannot look at too many yourself. And besides that, a uh, neural network can, of course, also co it make it makes it very easy to combine a lot of information and to really get the, the best information out of there. And then quantify more or less uh, how likely a certain collision is to be uh, a background collision or a signal collision. This is what you see here. 
um, where you see that on four, four top core production, we uh, try to uh, really see very, very rare, rare collisions. Now, what we also try to do there uh, is try to learn more from the uh, from the cross section for the frequency that four top quarks are produced, because we know that, uh, for example, the co coupling of the top quark and the Higgs boson is sensitive to change the uh, the amount of four top quarks that are being produced. So that means it allows us to directly measure the the, the coupling constant in the standard model between the top quark and the Higgs boson, which is called the top Yukawa coupling. Um, and this is very very powerful, and we uh, and we use this uh, to uh, uh, to it, to do a very competitive measurement of the top Yukawa coupling because you can measure it in some other ways as well. We can also make even more assumptions. So instead of saying the standard model is it, we can say, well, why don't we expand the standard model like a Taylor series and sort of put in the higher order terms, put all the interactions that we don't really know. And this is called an effective field theory. And then the sort of Taylor constants, which are in that case called Wilson's coefficients, uh, they describe the strength of each of these different extra higher order uh, couplings that or higher order particles that could uh, uh, contribute, and uh, uh, this uh, the nice thing about four tops is that it is sensitive to, to uh, interactions in the standard model that no other uh, that no other processes are sensitive to, and it can really set very uh, uh, strong limits on some of these uh, uh, Wilhelm coefficients, which is quite nice. And we can also do that in two dimensions because, of course, why would only one of them be? Uh, and there might be uh, like there might be cross terms, so we can do that too. Now, in the future, to we of course we continue to measure four top production because it will take us quite a while to really establish it. Uh, but it's also very clear that the methods that we use up to now are not really good enough to really make a statistical sense of uh, uh, discovery of four top production. So for that, we need to be more creative and for that that me also means that we uh, start to use smarter and smarter uh, machine learning techniques for example uh, there somebody uh, 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 uh who is a, a, a thai student who works with me he uh, he did his phd students on more modern and more advanced neural networks that also sort of correct for measurement uncertainties. And these are called pivoted adversarial neural networks. And he proved that with these neural networks, we can actually measure four top quarks much better. So this will be what he will do for his PhD, which is really nice. So what did we learn from all of that? And this is my last few slides. So there's time for some questions. Uh, so already start thinking about what questions you have. Uh, so when we uh, work for the Large Hadron Collider, the way we work is that we check if there are uh, <coughs> signatures for new particles that have similar behavior to the standard model particles we already know. And this allows us to both set constraints and measure the standard model more accurately. And we also, uh, use this to then directly measure new particles. And uh, it's almost, and when you know what you're searching for, you can train a neural net, and that makes it almost more sensitive. So that uh, is all I wanted to say for now. And I want to thank you for, atten for your attention. And uh, I uh, hope that I, uh, now that we can have some nice questions before I have to leave in 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Madam, for your wonderful and exciting. <laughs> presentation. So we have got a few mm -hmm. questions. So if you allow, we can start our discussion session. The first question, uh, what are your views on string theory? Apologies. Well, I think that one of the challenges at the moment in string theory is that string theory doesn't really make predictions. I'm an experimental physicist. Um, at the moment, I see st string theory as a nice uh, mathematical tool that is also being used <coughs> in particle physics to uh, string theory is being used, the, or techniques from string theory are being used to also do, make, calculate some of our integrals. Um, 
more accurately, but until string theory actually makes predictions, I think it's very, very difficult to say anything more than that it's a cool tool. Madam, uh, thank you. There is another similar question. So how can we prove this theory? Well, let's start with the basics. At the moment, string theory cannot even make, predict probabilities. So that will be the first step to actually predict how often something is done. Then we can test that. We are not even there yet. Okay. So we have another question. So can we detect how space time work at the Planck scale and verify the theories like string theory using modern particle accelerator? Um, yes thing. and no. Yes and no. So the problem, as I said, is that string the theory at the moment cannot make predictions. So then we cannot test it because the scientific method relies on the prediction. But at the same time, one might also argue that uh, with uh, that it's already quite clear that if string theory would would be able to make predictions, that most likely the predictions would be at higher energy than with at least the current accelerators we could test. So um, it's likely that we would need the next generation of accelerators at least to test that. Okay, well, thank you. We have another. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. so there's a question, yeah. So, so neutrinos next... have been, hmm. neutrinos are detected at the LHC all the time. So, and they were already, they have always been detected. So, um, <coughs> so your, the first part of your question is not correct. So neutrinos do, we, we do measure neutrinos in detail at dedicated experiments at colliders and also at, um, uh, at uh, beam facilities called neutrino factories, where we actually on purpose produce lots of neutrinos and then send them into detectors. So this is how all the different particles and also how the neutrino masses were, for example, uh, measured in uh, uh, that led to the Nobel Prize. So this is not new. Okay, well, so there is another question. Thank you. So dark matter particles be uh, light enough to be produced at the LAC mm -hmm. and if they were created at the LAC, would they escape through the detector unnoticed? So yes, they would escape uh, through the detector unnoticed, um, but we are set up to do this and to detect these. The problem is actually that um, uh, there's quite a range as far as the mass of dark matter particles that could exist. So there's a huge range, orders and orders of magnitude, what is still possible as far as the masses of dark matter particles. And the LHC is actually at the higher end of the mass. So the question would, would I think the, 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 using the current scientific know-how, I would rephrase this question is if dark matter particles are heavy enough to be produced at the LHC or at least to be detected at the LHC. So I do think that they, um, uh, that uh, if particle, uh, if these particles are already being produced, they might be produced already. And they just are, have so much similar background from the standard model that we just cannot see them yet because we need uh, more sophisticated uh, ways to reject the standard model or understand the standard model before we see them accurately, yeah. Madam, and there is another question in inbox, so I can read the question. So, why did mm -hmm. antimatter disappear from the universe? Nobody knows. You get a <laughs> Nobel Prize if you know it. Okay, okay, this may be the last question. Uh, so, what is the essence of studying particle physics if the particles survive for such a small time? So indeed, so the, the point is that indeed we do not save these particles. That's not why we study the particle physics. We study it to understand the, co the strength of these uh, different forces in nature and to uh, be able to see what matter is made out of and how different matter and how different forces interact. So the goal is not to collect particles. But if you understand how particles behave, for example, if you understand how electrons behave, you can use that then to uh, 
start making electrical uh, circuits or to start making semiconductors. But before that, you first need to understand how detectors behave in an atom. So we're still one step earlier. The essence of uh, particle physics at this point is really to test the these very, very simple and very, very um, uh, elementary equations to uh, understand how matter is actually uh, stuck together and what what matter particles exist. So we're not yet at the case where we can really use it, if that was the question. Okay, madam, uh, thank you. Uh, as there is no more questions, we can conclude our discussion session. Thanks again for giving us this opportunity. I think this is a great opportunity because uh, the student and viewers directly interact uh, uh, with you and they may learn a lot of things about the LAC and uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the things that, that you have explained. And the main aim of our program is to motivate. So as you know that uh, uh, still we are going in a corona situation. So uh, our mental situation, not that, uh, good as it was before uh, 2019 so we actually try to uh, encourage our students and thanks for giving us uh, time to uh, do this work and hopefully <laughs> after uh, the situation become improved we can invite you for a face-to-face -face session that will be very uh, uh, helpful for our student also well, I would definitely be open to that if it fits in my schedule. I think that uh, one important thing for uh, particularly undergraduate physics students to know is that uh, there are quite a lot of training opportunities also in Europe, also oh, for, uh, uh, for students from uh, uh, countries like Bangladesh. And I would like to point your attention particularly to the CERN summer student program. Google it. Uh, if you can get selected to that, and the selection rate is very, very low, uh, mm -hmm. this is a really, really excellent opportunity that I highly recommend. And for that, you only need uh, to have a physics or any sort of uh, technical science or so mathematics or engineering is fine too, degree. If you have finished the bachelor program, you're, you're ready to go there and they will pay for you for to travel to CERN and to be based at CERN. Uh, so there's also no issues at all with, uh, with money that, uh, but you do need to get selected, of course. So, but I highly recommend this program. So take okay. a look, uh, do a, do a web search. It, it will be very apply. helpful for them actually. So yeah, exactly. I got a, a, a one more question. If you allow uh, for the last mm -hmm. time we can take, uh, yeah. Question. What is the neutrino oscillation? Yeah. Okay. So neutrino oscillations uh, have to do with the fact that neutrinos have mass. So this is why neutrino oscillations are connected to this Nobel Prize of uh, the neutrino mass and neutrino oscillations from 2015. So the idea in quantum physics, and you might remember this from your quantum physics courses, that when you have massive uh, uh, quantum particles, that there is a difference between the different eigenstates depending on uh, uh, which uh, uh, which assumptions you take for the Hamiltonian. So there, uh, so this means that there are mass eigenstates and uh, and non mass mass eigenstates. And for neutrino oscillations, when uh, this means that there is an interference between the uh, the different eigenvectors. And when you have interference, you when you hear the word interference, you immediately connect that, of course, to waves. And indeed, this is true. So you get oscillations. So you get particles that change and that change from, say, being an electron neutrino to being a muon neutrino to being an electron neutrino and back, which is kind of strange. Eh? If you think about it, but yeah, this is a quantum world. So we get strange things. So uh, um, and that is specifically what a neutrino oscillation is. So it's a direct consequence of the fact that the neutrino has had mass. And in practice, what it means is that you have a particle that is a, super con a superposition of different final states of different eigenvectors. And that those uh, eigenvectors uh, 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 are connected to the different neutrinos that we know in the standard form. And this can only happen when these particles have mass. Thanks, madam. Uh... So I think uh, we can conclude. So I uh, would like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology for accepting mm -hmm. our invitations. So bye for today. And hopefully we can add another important webinar with you in near future. Yeah. Thank bye you then. very much. It was a pleasure. Thank and thanks you. for all the nice questions.